The 2000s were a very strange decade for Major League Baseball in terms of the World Series played in it. 14 different teams played in the Fall Classic within those 10 years, and there was only one repeat champion, the New York Yankees, on the bookends of the decade. It seemed like every series brought some new, different Cinderella team to the forefront, and it brought teams who had either never been or hadn't been in ages to the Fall Classic for a chance at glory. Today, we're going to take a look at one such instance of a World Series featuring a team who hadn't been to the series since 1959 and hadn't won since 1917, and a team who had never been in their 44 season existence. Ladies and gentlemen, we welcome you to the 2005 World Series. The 2005 World Series pitted the AL Central winning 99-63 best in the AL Chicago White Sox versus the NL wildcard 89-73 Houston Astros. As always, before we get into the series proper, let's examine how we got here by beginning with the 2005 season itself. This season would mark the so-called end of the steroid era in baseball, as at the start of the season, harsher penalties were put in place to crack down on steroid use in the continued wake of the Balco scandal. The Washington Nationals played exactly average ball in their inaugural season, going 81-81, and and this was the sixth season since 1949 in which not a single no-hitter was thrown, and this still stands as of 2023. But now, let's meet the teams of the 2005 World Series. Representing the American League, we have the Chicago White Sox. Shout out to my 11th grade chemistry teacher, Mrs. Ellickson, literally the only person I've ever met outside of Chicago who is a Southside and not a Cubs fan. Originally founded as a minor league team in 1893 in Sioux City, they eventually made the move to Chicago's Southside in 1900, formally becoming a major league team. They had success early on, appearing in the Fall Classic in 1906, 1917, and 1919, winning the first two and then Black Soxing the other. After that, they had exactly three playoff appearances in the next 86 seasons after 1919. Wow. Some Sox fans lived and died between playoff appearances without ever even witnessing one. Let that sink in. After finishing a respectable 83-79 with a second-place division finish under first-year manager and former White Sox player Ozzie Guillen, the Sox were looking somewhat optimistic heading into 2005. They added huge key bats in Jermaine Dye and Scott Podsednik, and a veteran catcher in A.J. Pruszynski to help boost manager Guillen's new small ball mentality for the team. This mentality worked as the White Sox ran out of the gate with the division lead on day one and never relinquished it, finishing 99-63, six games ahead of Cleveland for the division, and also taking the best record in the NL. In the first round, we retreated to a rare sock fight in the playoffs as the White Sox trounced the defending champs in a sweep of the series, including a massive 14-2 statement victory in Game 1. This was Southside's first playoff series victory since winning it all back in 1917. In the ALCS, the Sox faced the California Anaheim Angels of Los Angeles Angels of Anaheim, where they would lose Game 1 and then go on to win the next four after the White Sox pitchers threw four complete games in a row, including one from noted speedrunner Mark Burley in Game 2. This marked the first time anything like this had happened in a postseason since the Yankees threw five complete games in a row in the 1957 World Series with Don Larson pitching a perfect game. With that being said, the White Sox secured their first pennant since 1959, losing only one game in the process. Heading on down to Houston, we meet the Houston Astros. Originally founded in 1962 as the Houston Colt 45s, the Astros would be renamed to the Astros in 1965. They, like most expansion teams in any sport, unless you're the Vegas Golden Knights, were absolutely mediocre in their 43 previous seasons to this point, achieving only 8 postseason appearances and 3 LCS appearances. 2005 was supposed to be different, however, after finishing 92-70 and, and taking the Cardinals to a Game 7 in the NLCS the previous year, Houston looked to immediately continue their momentum and challenge the NL Central rivals for a shot at the National League's best. Their lineup and rotation were certainly ready, as they had aging Jeff Bagwell and Craig Biggio, but also had Brett Osmus, Lance Berkman, and Orlando Palmero. On paper, their rotation was stacked, as they had an aging Roger Clemens, a budding Roy Oswalt, who won 20 games in 2005, 
hardened veteran Andy Pettit, and one of the best relief pitchers in the game, Brad Lidge. This lineup should have been a real contender, however, Houston struggled to a 15-30 start before surging in the final two-thirds of the season to clinch a wildcard berth at 89-73. and In the NLDS, the Astros would face off against their playoff rivals in the Atlanta Braves, as this was their fifth meeting dating back to 1997. This series was incredibly entertaining and probably worth its own video in the future. The Astros would win Game 1 in Atlanta, lose Game 2 when an aging John Smoltz outdueled an aging Roger Clemens, take Game 3 at home, and then give one of the most entertaining games of all time in Game 4. I mean, this game was just insane. We got grand slams, Roger Clemens in relief, and it was, at the time, the longest game in postseason history, going 18 innings. But this has since been tied by Game 3 of the 2018 World Series and Game 3 of the 2022 ALDS in terms of innings played. Astros would win on a walk-off solo shot and advance to face their arch-division rivals, the Cardinals, in the NLCS. In the NLCS, Houston shocked the baseball world by single-handedly beating the 100-win best record in baseball St. Louis Cardinals in five. On the pool. In the air left field, and Pools has given St. Louis the lead. A dramatic, towering three-run home run. <clears throat> Six games, securing their first pennant in their history and a date with the White Sox in Chicago. We've made it. Welcome to Game 1 of the 2005 World Series. We are in U.S. Cellular Field on October 22nd, 2005, 7.05 p.m. Central Standard Time. Chicago would throw out a one Jose Contreras to face Roger Clemens, who would be pitching in his 8th World Series. Clemens would unfortunately exit after just 53 pitches with a sore hamstring, giving the ball up to Wandy Rodriguez. Jermaine Dye would begin the scoring with an immediate home run in the bottom of the first off Clemens, and then the Sox would tack on two more in the next inning thanks to A.J. Pruszynski and Juan Uribe. Houston, after scoring one in the second, would follow that up with two runs of their own in the top of the third. That would be all for Houston as Contreras pitched seven innings of shutdown ball before being removed to start the eighth. This was the first time in five games that Chicago was forced to go to their bullpen, bringing out Neil Kotz and Bobby Jinks to close out the game. Chicago would get one more run in the bottom of the 8th to make the score 5-3, and would put the Sox up 1-0 in the series. Welcome to Game 2, we're in the same place, same time, plus 10 minutes, one day later. Speedrunner Mark Burley took the hill for the Sox in the pouring rain matching up against World Series veteran Andy Pettit. After a quiet first, Burley would allow a home run in the first pitch of the second to Morgan Innsberg, but Pettit would calmly one-up Burley by allowing two to score in the bottom half of the second. Houston would come back swinging, however, putting up one in the third and then two in the fifth, respectively. The lead was 4-2 in favor of the Astros at the opening of the seventh. Pitcher Dan Wheeler would allow a double to Juan Uribe with one out, and then would get a strikeout but walk the next batter, Tadahito Iguchi, to bring Jermaine Dye to the plate. On a full count, controversy would strike as Wheeler would throw a pitch high and inside to which Dye apparently tried to back away from the ball, hitting something and flying out of the way. Now, dear viewer, we want to give you the chance to guess how umpire Jeff Nelson proceeded next with the call. We'll let you watch it in real time and in slow-mo replay. And keep in mind that replay review had not yet been instituted at this point in time. Here we go. Did Jeff Nelson A. Call a foul ball like it clearly should be, B hit Jermaine Dye on the wrist, or C, delegate the call to rules mastermind on the crew that day, Angel Hernandez. Did you pick A? You are correct. Did Jeff Nelson pick B? Yes, yes he did. Did replay technology exist at this time? No, no it didn't apparently. As a result of all this, Dye was awarded first base, much to the protest of Astros manager Phil Garner, who had front row seats to the fact that this was clearly a foul ball. Because of this, Wheeler was immediately removed from the game in favor of Chad Qualls, and because of course he did, he proceeded to give up a grand slam to Paul Canerco on the very next pitch. The score was now 6-4 in favor of the Sox. The 8th passed quietly, but as we headed into the 9th, Houston decided that they would not pass quietly. Bobby Jenks was brought in to save the game, but immediately blew it, allowing two runs to score via a Jose Vizcaino pinch hit single. The game, now tied, headed to the bottom of the ninth where Houston would send Brad Pujols' Still My Daddy Lidge to send a game to extras. 
With one out, Scott Podsednik stepped up to the plate and promptly said, Move over, Pujols. I am also Lidge's daddy, knocking a walk-off solo shot out of the park to give the Sox a 7-6 win and a 2-0 series lead. Because of course he didn't, Podsednik had hit no home runs during the regular season, but this was his second of the postseason. This game also marked the last time until 2021 that a home team hit a Grand Slam in the World Series. Game 3 began with our pal and savior Alan H. Bud Selig declaring that the roof of Minute Maid Park was to remain open, weather permitting, for Game 3. The Astros objected to this on the grounds that their record in games with the roof closed was better than with the retractable roof open. Daddy Selig said, uh, no, to this request, and the roof was to remain open for Game 3. Man, why is there always so much controversy at Minute Maid Park? Andy Pettit would be tasked with protecting the home fort this game as he matched up against John Garland for what would become, until Game 3 of the 2018 World Series, the longest World Series game in terms of length of all time, and also tied for most innings played. Lance Berkman and Craig Biggio would begin the scoring in the first, while Houston's defense would help Pettit out of a jam to protect the lead. Houston would then put up two more runs in the third off a Uribe throwing error, but also with the help of an Oswald sack bunt. Shoutouts to the old National League. The oh. tries one. And a Biggio single. The White Sox finally decided to wake up to begin the fifth as they tallied up not one, not two, but five runs to take the lead thanks in large part to Przinski's two-run double into Tall's Hill. <sighs> Rest in peace. Houston would get back a run they desperately needed with two outs in the eighth to bring the scoring even at five heading into extras. The Astros would threaten again in the 10th and 11th, but to no avail, leading the game to the 14th inning. In the 14th, with two outs, the stalemate would break as former Astro and current office employee Jeff Blum would homer with two outs, putting Chicago ahead. Two infield singles from the Sox would be followed by two walks as another one was tacked on for insurance. In the bottom of the 14th, up 7-5, Mark Burley would come in to seal it after Houston threatened with first and third with two outs. The White Sox were now up 3-0 in the series, and Burley would become the first pitcher since Bob Turley of the Yankees in the 1958 World Series to start the previous game and then save the next one. We enter Game 4 with the White Sox on the verge of history, while the Astros are trying to save their series in any way they can, being bested in all facets up to this point. In case you were wondering, yes, the roof was still open for this warmer Texas night on October 26th. Freddie Garcia and Brandon Backey faced off for the first true pitcher's duel of the series. In a rotation with Roger Clemens, Andy Pettit, and Roy Oswalt, it's crazy that Houston's best game was pitched by their fourth man. Both starters win a fantastic seven shutout innings, while each narrowly avoiding jams as Podsednik would triple in the third to no avail, and Jason Lane would strike out with the bases loaded in the sixth. It would all fall apart for Houston in the eighth, however, as Brad Lidge got daddied once again, giving up the only run of the game. Willie Harris would single, Podsednik would bunt him over, Carl Everett would advance Harris again on a fielder's choice, and then Jermaine Dye would drive him in with a single, cementing his case as the series MVP. After a slightly sticky eighth, the White Sox would bring Bobby Jenks to the mound to try and clinch the series. Jason Lane would single and then would be sack bunted over by Osmus. Uribe made an incredible play to get pinch hitter Chris Burke out, and then Orlando Palmero ground out to Juan Uribe on a bang bang play to give Chicago their first title in 88 years. Tying run at second, two out, Palmero over the head of Jenks. Uribe charges, throws, out! And the White Sox have won the World Series! Juan Uribe with a play, charging it, throwing it, and the White Sox celebrate their first title in 88 years. In the span of just two seasons, baseball saw both Sox break their curses and back-to-back -back World Series sweeps. Funnily enough, the last time the Sox teams won championships, they also went back-to-back, -back, back in 1917 and 1918 respectively. Jermaine Dye would be awarded the series MVP after his clutch single and posting a 438 average with 3 RBI. The city of Chicago would have their first title since the Chicago Fire won the 1998 MLS Cup a few months after the Bulls won their final finals. 
Neither team would make the playoffs in 2006, unfortunately, as the Astros would fall one game behind the 83-win St. Louis Cardinals for the division, which won't have any future implications, I'm sure, and the White Sox would fall to third in their division behind good Twins and Tigers teams. Houston would experience a long period of suffering, even after moving to the AL in 2013, but their suffering has been resolved as they have cemented themselves as the giant in the AL over the past six seasons, with two titles to their name. <clears throat> Chicago, you got some ups and downs, but ultimately, your down peaked, if you will, with Tony La Russa's corpse at your helm, and the only good thing to come out of you post-2005 is this fantastic radio call. Seriously, go listen to it. It is mandatory listening for all baseball fans. The best hitter on the team is Jake Berger. We're a triple-A team. The craziest thing about this series is that it was good, despite no one seeming to remember it outside of Southside. While it was a sweep, yes, the games were competitive and even as Houston took it to a White Sox team that had one of the greatest single seasons of all time. Chicago joined the 95 Braves and the 99 Yankees as the only teams to lose a game or less in the postseason en route to a sweep in the World Series. They were also the first team since the 1990 Reds to lead their division the entire year and then sweep the series, joining the 27 Yankees as well. This White Sox team was seriously that good. And Houston was good too, they just couldn't get it to fall into place outside of their three dominant starting pitchers and Brad Lidge. What's wild is that, while forgotten in terms of maybe the biggest name teams weren't playing, no series has been forgotten in a way that this one has. When the Cubs made the series in 2016, just look at these ESPN and CBS tweets and graphics. This was brutal, and a literal all-time team like the 05 White Sox don't deserve it. It's okay, White Sox. We still love you. You just make it really, really hard sometimes.